Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. And welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap, as always, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience, so if at any time during today's presentation you have a question for our speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate, just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also happening at the end of today's webinar, we'll be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is zero to 100 million downloads, building a modern open source CI project. Our speakers today are Steve Burton, who is the CMO at Harness, and Brad Rzyski, I think I got that right, who is the founder of Drone.io. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Shelley. Thank you. All right, Steve, go take it away. Great. Thanks all for joining us. Uh, we've got a great story to tell you, um, and feel free to chime in with any questions you've got. Um, I'd like to welcome Brad. Um, Brad Rizeski Riz um, is the CEO and founder of Drone.io, um, and Brad's been working for pretty much the last decade um, on an open source project. And I thought it'd be great, great for him to share his story um, right from the beginning all the way through to present day. So you can get an understanding of what it's like, um, the highs, the lows, um, and, and what it really takes to, to get traction in the open source community. Um, so Brad, welcome. Um, I thought a good place to start would be your first job. So um, should, we, uh, should, we, should we tap on that? Yes. So, um... You know, my, my first job uh, was right out of college. Um, this was a ways back, but uh, I, I'd worked at General Electric. You know, you're kind of quintessential big corporation. And I had worked at G Capital Finance in the banking division. And uh, it was it was a great job. And and the software we were, were writing was really cool. It, it, um, it was responsible for our, our lending platform and accepting customer payments. So dealing with, um, you know, a lot of high volume transactions and, and dollar amounts. So, you know, software that needs to work very well, that needs to be very well tested and very precise. And, and oh, go ahead. And what was the background like? Did you did you study engineering? Like, did you do anything at college? Like, how did you get that job? Um, yes, yes. Uh, software uh, in college as well as French randomly. Nice. and. Was there a certain point in that in that company where you you kind of given projects or you're exposed to, to kind of like the software delivery process? Like what what was it that stuck out for you the most? Yes, so I think it was probably one of my first big projects where uh, some of the challenges of of large uh, organizations and and systems design kind of kicked in. Um, first project, you know, the first thing we went to do is is set up a Jenkins instance, right? We, we got our version control set up, we got Jenkins set up, um, and you know we wanted to start development. Uh, and that's kind of where uh, we just kind of constantly were running into blockers as a team. Uh, you know, we didn't have, you know, first thing we wanted to do is set up our Jenkins pipeline, but we didn't have access to set up Jenkins. Uh, then the second thing we wanted to do um, was, was configure our Jenkins project. And then we didn't have access to to configure it, right? That that had to go through a change control process, which happened monthly, and and that slowed us down. Um, and then the next thing we needed to do is install software on on the servers, and that also had to go through a change control process, and that took time. And so uh, it was kind of like the one of the first big hurdles of, of of software development in a large company was really just getting up and running. Uh, in some cases, it took months. And I think the way you described it to me is this sucks. <laughs> and so the two yeah. things you kind of pointed out was provisioning servers and getting up and running, but then actually nothing to do with, with writing software. It was getting your pipelines up and running. 
um and saw like was it just you on or was it the teams like was it was it well known within GE like how did the teams feel about it all yeah I, I mean I don't think this was unique to General Electric at all right if you think back to the time when we were doing waterfall development and you know we were we were doing things like monthly releases or quarterly releases and change control meetings and um you know, things were very uh, separated in these development organizations between operations and, and developers, right? That's why we have DevOps today and we try to marry those those two things um, together. And you mentioned the fact that you got promoted and then got like quit. <laughs> like um, not many people do that where a week after they get promoted, they just quit their job. Um, what, what was it that tipped you over the edge despite them giving you their best interest that you feel valued and you should be higher and more senior in the company? Well, I thought that there was just this massive opportunity to, to focus on the enterprise uh, in terms of software, right? This was, I think this was going back to, you know, I'm going to forget the exact year, but let's say 2010, 2011, whatever it was. And, and everyone was hyper-focused on the cloud and everyone was building all this really cool SaaS software and and I just felt like the enterprise was kind of being left behind. And and I just saw this massive opportunity to, uh, you know, kind of go out on my own and, and try to solve these problems that it just didn't look like anyone else was was trying to solve at the time. Got it. And, and I think you mentioned like Docker was was kicking off around that time. So what was the what was the thinking there? Yeah, so it was it was actually even pre-Docker, but uh, containers were, you know, I, I would say they'd been around um, for a while at that point, but but they weren't widely used. And um, one, you know, one of the things I wanted to solve, uh, which kind of harkened back to General Electric, was the ability to get your environments up and running quickly. Um, you know, it, it originally started out as, as getting your development environments up and, and running and your server environments up and running. Um, you know, a lot of enterprises were were on premise, you know, they, they weren't moving to the cloud yet, or they were tentative to move to the cloud. And so this idea of really taking that Heroku experience and bringing it to the enterprise, and that's kind of what led me down the path of, of containers, right? Containers, you know, if you were, were operating on prem, uh, and you, you didn't necessarily, you weren't using virtual machines, right? These were bare metal machines in, in data centers and, and containers, you know, I really thought would be a, a game changer for these, for these enterprises. Right. And you literally started coding the day after you quit your job. Yes, I was very, I, th I think it was the earliest I've ever woken up. Uh, I was so excited to start the next day. <laughs> Got it. And uh, what was, again, uh, sorry, sorry for the, the laughter, but you started coding and then I think you talked about you hit once again Jenkins because you <laughs> needed to build and test your code. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, my, the initial focus was was really on a Heroku like experience to the enterprise. And, you know, as you can imagine, uh, you know, what that would look like today is, is more something like Kubernetes, right? Or, or a platform as a service. And you end up building a very complex piece of software. And so you want to build and test and continuously deploy that. And so, you know, to do that, I set up my own uh, Jenkins instance. And I, I want to say I probably spent the whole week just trying to get it up and running and working and, uh, you know, integrating with with GitHub and Git, uh, and you know, I, I I saw an opportunity there. And do you, do you still remember that moment where you're like, maybe I could solve this and the provision issue? Like, what was that? What were you doing at that time? Right. So, I mean, I think that was kind of the moment I thought, um, you know, what one of the biggest challenges with Jenkins is is automatically provisioning your your environments, right? Uh, problems we hit at General Electric that, uh, you know, it, you know, in, in shared CI environments, right? We couldn't upgrade Java because multiple teams were using the JVM. We didn't have isolation. Um, we had sporadic usage across servers. Sometimes they would be 10%, sometimes they would be 80%. Uh, and so I realized that uh, as I was trying to solve for this Heroku for the enterprise use case, and as I was, you know, using containers and, and working on orchestration that I could actually take this same technology and apply it to the CI space. You know, what if we gave developers an easy way uh, to provision their, their own develop, development environments? 
uh, provision their own CI environments? What if we could make it more self-service and more turnkey? Got it. And you said it took roughly four, four months to get the first kind of MVP uh, out the door. Um, what did, what was that process like, those four months where you didn't have a job and I'm, I'm guessing you, you're in, in an apartment or somewhere just, just coding? Yes. Yeah. Caffeine fueled, um, you know, a lot of hours, but it, it was just a ton of fun to to kind of, you know, this that's the most exciting time of a project, right? When you're first starting out and you're kind of immersing yourself in the in the problem space. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the first version was pretty simple, right? It, like I said, it used LXC, which was a, a precursor to Docker, uh, but it could spin up, you know, containers in, um, you know, I, I think it was, you know, two seconds, you know, you could have the environment up and running, you could have it executing your pipeline inside of a container. And, you know, it supported uh, really any language that ran in a container and all the pipelines were isolated. They didn't conflict with each other. Um, it was, yeah, it was really cool once that first version came together. And I'm curious, did you get requirements from any customers or did you just have it squarely in your mind exactly what you wanted to build? I thought, you know, I, I was thinking the whole time of what, what would have worked at GE. Uh, and right. So, you know, hadn't talked to any customers or anything at this point. And what was the reason you went with SaaS? So you, one of the key things you said was the first version was SaaS. So like, why, why SaaS? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I think before I had mentioned that I wanted to build, um, you know, software for the enterprise because they weren't going to the cloud and yet I started with SaaS. And so, right, I, yeah. uh, I asked myself why I did that all the time. Um, <laughs> I don't really have a good answer, but I mean, SaaS was was low barrier to entry uh, at the time in terms of getting customers and getting users uh, into the product. And, you know, think back to 2012, 2013, uh, that's what everyone was doing at that time. Everyone was looking at SaaS. Yeah, definitely. And I think that like the next kind of visualization where enterprises told you we don't want SaaS, that, that was kind of very similar to, to what I went through app dynamics at that time where we had SaaS and on-premise and 80% of the customers were like, we want, we want on-premise. Um, so was that a shock or was it, you kind of knew in the back of your mind that maybe, maybe it needed to be on-prem? Yeah. I mean, in hindsight, it made a ton of sense, right? That, uh, you know, enterprises, they, they were still slow to adopt cloud at this point and they were very concerned about their data and their IP being, hosted somewhere out of their control. And, and so the big realization was that these organizations didn't necessarily want uh, a SaaS-based CI. They, they really just wanted a better Jenkins. They wanted something that, that they could install you know, on their own servers, on-premise, uh, that, that had a, a more developer-friendly self-service workflow. And I hear it a lot of times where, especially in startups and, and entrepreneurs, where they say you skate to the puck, so you almost know where the puck's going. But I think in your case, you were just super early, where you almost needed to to kind of be where customers are and then have that transition to to where they're going to. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I think getting getting that initial version in SaaS, you know, we we did get a ton of good feedback uh, from that. And so, you know, we were able to iterate and build that into the product. And, and then ultimately, uh, what we brought to the enterprises ended up being that much better. Got it. And around about that time, I guess open source was kicking off. Like, I, I remember it very well. I remember seeing GitHub and thinking, what's that? Uh, oh, I know a lot of DevOps kind of meetups, Docker and containers was like the cool, the cool beans that back then. Um, and then there was obviously a NoSQL war between Cassandra and MongoDB, who's the best. Um, like what was, what was for you the defining moment where you thought maybe we should look at open source? Sure. Well, I mean, as a developer, of course you love open source and, and, you know, you want your work to be out there so that other people can see it and, and collaborate and, and especially in, in, um, you know, at, at that point in time, open source was very aspirational, uh, you know, at, at a lot of large corporations back in 2012, you know, uh, we weren't we weren't contributing to open source. We may not have even been using open source uh, at that time. And so the idea that I could, I could take what I was doing and, and put that out there for the world was, was really exciting. And then uh, if you think back to that time, there were, 
uh, a ton of, of companies that were fundraising uh, and, and they were open source companies, like you said, uh, um, ones that come to mind are like, I think Docker, uh, you know, Elastic, Mongo, uh, and there were plenty of others. Got it. And you said day one, you wrote a blog. And so we've actually found the blog. We went back on the time machine on the internet and actually pulled up the blog. Um, and I guess from then on, it, it all went crazy. Yeah, I mean, it was it was very unexpected. So we we had, you know, pushed the code base to GitHub, uh, and and it hit Hacker News. I, I within minutes, like we didn't even post it. Um, and and that day, it was, you know, a top trending project on on Hacker News, and and we had just had tons of inbound interest in the project. It was insane. And you said as well, the next two days, it, not just that you didn't get publicity on the blogs, but just the success of the project. And I think as well, even though like a few weeks later, you you start getting major pull requests and, and big companies, enterprises want to contribute. Yeah, I, I think within the first 24 hours or, or 48, like it said on the last slide, we'd hit um, over 2,500 GitHub stars. Um, you know, which which kind of gives you a measure of just how many people were, were visiting the repository and, and taking a look. And I think the most impressive thing or the most shocking thing was, you know, coming from the corporate world, um, again, we hadn't used a lot of open source at that point in time, right? It was still a lot of enterprise proprietary software. So, uh, you know, when I open sourced it, I thought it would be a lot of, you know, hobbyist developers, uh, people looking at it in their spare time. Uh, when in fact it was a ton of of enterprise developers and engineers that were interested in the software you know these kind of like rebel engineers that you know maybe they had a central jenkins install or a, you know uh, you know some large ci installation and and they were downloading drone and, and day one trying it out and how did you decide where you wanted the project to go so obviously you had a, you know, like the first version and the general concept, you, you kind of knew what you wanted to build. How did you let the community or direct the community? I mean, at first, I mean, there was, there was of course, in the early days, a ton to do on the project, you know, bug fixes, feature improvements. Um, I think one of the coolest things that happened was, uh, I'll never forget, um, we launched Drone and somewhere around the launch date, Circle CI had just announced uh, support for GitHub Enterprise. Um, and then within 48 hours of us launching the open source edition of Drone, we'd gotten a pull request to support GitHub Enterprise. And I think a couple of days later, we had support for Bitbucket. And a couple of days later, we had support for GitLab. And then all of a sudden, Drone you know, was, was more feature rich than um, a lot of the other solutions, uh, SaaS based solutions that were on the market. And you mentioned like the bug fixes and the features, like part of the, the project with it being so successful is is the groin pens, which kind of go back one slide. Um, like how much time were you spending a day? Like you look back at the first few weeks, was it, I mean, were you, were you getting one hour of sleep a night? Like what did, what did the work look like? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. To, I mean, it was, it was over a course of a number of years. I think it just became progressively more and more work. Um, you know, at, at the start, you know, I think it was easy to kind of set boundaries and, and have a work-life balance. But, uh, you know, over time, as the project grew, uh, we were just flooded with feature requests and support. And, you know, pretty much any time of the day, there, there was someone in our chat room. Uh, that was looking for help. It could be, you know, eight o'clock at night. It could be 1 a.m. It could be 4 a.m. You know, there was someone in some time zone that that was looking for help. And, you know, instinctively you would think, right, open source means you're going to get more people helping. And while that's true, you do, you do get more people helping. Uh, the number of people that are that are looking for support uh, and that are using your software uh, that number of people kind of grows, you know, exponentially faster than the number of people who are just kind of joining on um, and, and taking on maintainer roles. So it's it's incredibly difficult. And I mean, we're we're in 2014 now, which is kind of two years after you kicked it off. Like, how are you surviving? Like, how are you paying the bills and and kind of being able to continue with this? So uh, yeah, I think 
and that, that's probably an important point to address, right? You know, I didn't, you know, when I had left my job, there had been some planning in that, right? So making sure I had enough savings and a buffer and, you know, I'm married. So, you know, my wife has a job and, and she was able to support us. So I was very fortunate in that respect. And was there any a time early on where you had the successes where you wanted to raise money or, or go and kind of borrow money or, or get other people on board? Yes. Uh, um, I, I think the the original goal was to fundraise. Got it. And one thing I'm kind of amazed at is just the lack of promotion. So with a simple blog that you wrote on the drone website, someone picked it up. Next thing, it's in Hacker News. Next thing, it's all over GitHub. Like, like how how do you how does word get around? Like, obviously, you've got communities and people speak to each other, and you've got a trade shows like. When you say that you didn't know self-promotion, like maybe you could share a little bit about what that looked like. <laughs> obviously, you must have attended a few meetups and and spoke to some some friends, but it, there was no paid advertising. There was no kind of like um, you see a lot of tech companies do these days. Yeah, I mean, I hate to say that it's kind of uh, one of those like if you build it, they will come moments, but it it really was. Um, Maybe it's that us developers just have a, a really good knack for for sniffing out free software. Um, but you know what what really happened is is uh, the the week of launch I did a meetup and it hit Hacker News and I say I think those two things are how a lot of people found out about it and at that point it just became kind of word of mouth people writing blog posts tutorials, um, you know websites like. Um, you know, that focus on developer tools and, you know, dev2 and, and community, uh, you know, type of, of blogging platform. So that's how most people found out about us. Got it. And back then, would you say you were first to market? You were only like, were you the next after Jenkins or was there, was there other tools that people were kicking about with? So in, in terms of open source, um, you know, uh, a, you know, a precursor to drone was Travis CI. So at the yeah. time Travis CI yeah, was very focused on on VMs, and so you know one thing we did with Drone was, you know we we looked at Jenkins, we looked at Travis CI. Uh, of course, you take a lot of learnings from those two systems, but the goal was, you know, if, if Travis had been built for for you know containers or bring your own build environment instead of VMs, how would they have built it? And so we tried to take inspiration from them uh, and, and build that in Drone. And then you also had a lot of uh, proprietary systems like Circle CI, and at the time they they were focused on on VMs uh, as well. I think what Drone was was the first continuous integration system to be built on containers and Docker, and it, and and I think that was revolutionary because um, you know if you had used something like Travis and and VMs, you use the VM they gave you. Maybe they give you 20 options, but you had to use what they gave you. And with Drone, uh, any developer could bring their own build environment. As long as it was a Docker image uh, stored in the registry, uh, you could bring your own image with everything you need installed in it, and you are ready to go. Yeah, one one thing that struck me as well, speaking of some drone users and customers, is just it literally takes five minutes. Was that like was there a goal you had in mind to make it easy, or was it just like was it how fast you could go, basically? Sure. I mean, I think the 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 design goal was really um, to kind of remove the red tape I had experienced at, at GE uh, around Jenkins. Um, I think Jenkins kind of just being centrally managed uh, and, and Jenkins being built for an era where you had separate operations and development teams. Um, I wanted to make sure that when we built Drone that, you know, the developers were kind of in charge, right? They could configure their pipeline, um, that it would live where their code lives, kind of put them in full control uh, that, you know, they could bring their own build images. And so, you know, taking that kind of uh, developer first approach, um, I think it made it a lot easier for, for developers to onboard quickly. Got it. And how do you grow the community? So you mentioned like you had a handful of enterprises that were willing to contribute. So you must've started off with tens of people contributing. Like how do you get that to scale of hundreds 
is it just you, you work all hours of the day you 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 put as much effort into it you you merge all the pull requests like is it that simple or is it is there other things that you people need to be aware of <laughs> sure i mean it's that simple in a sense right you, you're just the more people that come in the more inbound interest you get um and, and the more pull requests you start to receive so it, it's simple in that sense but of course um it takes a ton of, of time to review pull requests, to provide feedback, to provide reviews. So it, it's almost like, in a sense, transitioning from an engineering role to an engineering manager. I mean, you're, you're, it requires a tremendous amount of time uh, to, to manage these communities. Was there any pull requests looking back that you rejected that you were like, no, we're not going to do that? Or like, that's not the right thing for the project? Yeah, I mean, um, absolutely. Um, and for a variety of reasons, right? In, in some cases, there's stuff that that you know when you when you take code and you merge it into your project, you're making a commitment to supporting that code for a long period of time, maybe even in, in perpetuity. And so, yeah. you know, I try to be very careful about um, you know what we merge into the core of the product, making sure that it's it's in line with Drone's goals of of keeping things simple. Um, and in a lot of cases, what we try to do is make drone extensible, right? So that we don't have to build everything into drone. Um, you know, that makes it more difficult to, to maintain the project. So, you know, how do we make drone more extendable so that teams can kind of, you know, uh, tailor drone to their specific needs? And so that's been a big goal of ours. Got it. Um, I guess the topic of burnout always comes up um software delivery i think um a few of us have gone through that in our times of being an engineer um what was interesting for you was cisco came along and wanted to put people full-time on the project yeah like that was like a huge thumbs up i guess that was a huge milestone when i realized that that drone was really on to something and um had a ton of enterprise interest so yeah cisco had, had was kind of like the first company that that reached out and wanted to be a corporate sponsor of of the project and, and they wanted to have you know dedicated um, full-time engineers working and, and contributing so yeah that that was that was an incredible milestone for us and if you look back at that time how many committers or contributors did you have actively working on the project uh i mean i want to it definitely fluctuated um you know because i was working on it full-time uh we had you know probably a couple dozen people that were you know regularly submitting pull requests once a month or or maybe more frequently it just varied but we had a yeah. good amount of people working on it and how do you i mean i i've been part of outages and i've written software that uh ironically caused an outage uh uk government website um, which was about 15 years ago um <laughs> did, did you take it personally like like how stressful like how, i mean it's, it's an unpleasant feeling when you know someone you've written breaks but when you've got big enterprises like breathing down your neck uh yeah. at what at what point did you just say enough's enough right yeah so this is I, and i think it's important to talk about burnout because a lot of open source uh, authors kind of uh face this issue right there's tons of blog posts about it um you know as drone grew more in popularity like i said we had people at all hours of the day in our forums asking for help and I think one, one of the moments where I realized that something needed to change, you know, I was feeling the burnout and I knew something needed to change when I think it was two in the morning and, you know, this large enterprise uh, was using drone and they, they were having an outage and they had reached out and wanted my help troubleshooting it. And I helped them. Um, and, and, but it was kind of that realization, like, why am I doing this at, at two in the morning? You know, this isn't my job. Um, you know, they, they weren't necessarily contributing to the project. They weren't sponsoring it financially. And, and I, I think that was kind of like the peak burnout where I was giving way too much of myself. Uh, you know, the open source community is phenomenal, but, and, and I know everyone wants the best, but they will take as much as you're willing to give them. And if you give them too much, that's, that's when you hit the burnout. Got it. And did, was it something that just changed the next day? Or did it take weeks? Did it take months for you to, to make that transition? I, I think it, it took a while to make the transition, but that's when I knew, yeah, I, I needed to change something. I, I couldn't keep up at this pace. Got it. And I, 
this is kind of where you hit draw an enterprise. So you kind of, the enterprise is asking you, can we give us a support? And this is kind yeah. of, I guess, your answer to that. Yes. So how did you go about commercializing the support that was required for, for these big enterprises? Sure. So, in, in actually, as a, as a precursor, um, you know, the first thing I tried to do was was to get large organizations to support drone financially through donations. Uh, you know, intuitively that seemed like the best option, but uh, surprisingly, so I went to maybe ten of our largest enterprise organizations, and I I just none of them were set up to to donate. Um, that just wasn't a thing. You know, people did then. Uh, you know, they knew how to buy software. They knew how to pay for support, but they, there was no enterprise process uh, for a developer to ask their boss to, to sponsor a project. And so, um, you know, that, that's why I ended up going the, the enterprise edition route, uh, you know, the, the, you know, selling commercial versions of the software, selling support. And so the way I went about doing that was, was taking, you know, enterprise features, you know, features that maybe the, the average developer didn't care about, but that the enterprise really cared about. So, uh, the, the first feature that we introduced in Drone Enterprise was, was support for Vault. So sourcing your secrets for Vault, you know, in kind of this, you know, enterprise um, secret management system. And we got $100 a month there. Like walk, walk us through the pricing rationale for that because that seems a bit random. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing. And so, you know, as a developer, you think, well, I don't know. Um, you know, what do developers, you know, what would I be willing to pay? And, uh, you know, of course, um, you know, the there's a few realities that set in. You know, number one is that most enterprise software and subscriptions are, are significantly more expensive and, and for good reason. And uh, the second one is you actually have to have a lot of customers, a lot of customers to be profitable at that price point. Um, and so, yeah, that was just, well, uh, that, that was just me not knowing what I was doing. You know, first time founder mistakes. No, I mean, the, the rationale's there, right? If you can get a hundred, like lots of companies to pay you like, like a thousand bucks a year, like you only need a hundred or a few hundred customers and you, you're making decent money for yourself. Um, and on the topic of VC funding, it was it, we're in 2017 now did you ever did you ever try and go back and, and and get vc funding yeah so you know i i tried you know mentioned i tried to get vc funding early on and uh i i, I didn't have any luck with that um you know the primary reason at the time was uh you know kind of there were there was a, a number of of competitors in the space uh, i had a co-founder and and um you know, he he had had left the the project. Um, you know, a co-founder breakup, but in a good way. You know, we remained friends, but but he just um, had a lot of life events that were happening, and he couldn't you know burden the risk of a startup. And so, you know, when anyone who's gone through the fundraising process, uh, you know, when a co-founder leaves, that's that's kind of like a red flag for VCs. And so, uh, it made it very hard for for Drone to fundraise. Um, I think most most of the VCs I met with probably thought Drone would would die. Uh, back in, you know, 2013, 2014. Uh, fast forward um, to, to, to recently and more in the last, I, I think, year or so, um, you know, what used to be a negative, VCs actually looked at it as a positive. They couldn't believe Drone was so successful despite all of the, the, the stumbles we had along the way. And so, um, you know, there, were, there was definitely a lot more interest, uh, I would say that. And if you look at some of the, the enterprise customers that are paying you money today, which are the ones that you're most proud of where you, you feel like, hey, that was me and GE, like that team is kind of where I would have been, um, but I'm, I'm kind of solving that that challenge for them. Uh, definitely. Um, I mean, I think it's funny because probably most of the customers are are coming from, you know, that that same kind of background where you know they had central teams and uh you know one of them one of them that comes to mind is is reddit right you know they they have this small team of of engineers that that's kind of like their platform team and they're managing uh ci as a shared service right and and they're managing jenkins and you know jenkins becomes their full-time job it's not supposed to be their full-time job but it becomes their full-time job uh, and then they install drone and 
uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, it, it, it maybe they're spending one hour a month uh, maintaining it and it just kind of frees them up for all these other tasks. And then uh, the other thing I love, and, and this was something that Reddit mentioned, uh, you know, recently was, you know, their, their developers are able to use the system self-service. They're also building their own plugins. Uh, you know, if you think back to the Jenkins day, you need a plugin, you have to have an admin install it. Um, you know, with drone, any, anyone can build a plugin. A plugin is just a Docker container. And so uh, it's really cool to see these organizations just using these features and, and to see the impact and, and how it's making their lives easier. Got it. And if you kind of look at drone today, so you've got over 100 million downloads on Docker Hub, either in over 150 million builds a year for companies around the world. You've got a, a huge active monthly community that are engaging and, and using the product. Um, where do you think it could get to, like long term? I mean, you know, long term, I think it could be, you know, uh, in, in ways that Jenkins was was ubiquitous. I hope that will be drone years from now. So, uh, you know, I hope we have. You know, uh, I, how what's there? There are millions of developers. I hope we have millions of active users. Um, I hope we have thousands of contributors. I hope, I hope that everyone has an opportunity to use Drone, and, and we can kind of you know fill fill the gap um, that and and help teams that are are using Jenkins today. And you made the the decision recently to to kind of sell Drone IR. Um, as opposed to VC funding. So for, for those of you that didn't see the news, Harness actually acquired Drone IR. Um, I know we, we did a lot of reporter interviews and some of the questions you got were, well, is this just because of COVID and like, you, did you hit a brick wall and like, why are you selling your company? And I think you gave like some very kind of interesting responses. So like for you, why was now the, the right time? Right. So, I mean, definitely not COVID. Uh, you know, Drone was growing and, um, you know, I think any entrepreneur, you're you're going to look at at your options, right? So you can continue bootstrapping, you can fundraise, you you can look at acquisitions and partnerships. Um, the you know one of the things I would say is if you look at the open source ecosystem today, most of the projects that we all love have strong corporate sponsors, right? Uh, so that was one thing I, I considered when when trying to decide you know what to do next with Drone, right? I wanted to take it to the next level. Um, you know, I wanted to help grow the community. You know, we, we needed more resources. Uh, you know, as the community grew, we, we just weren't able to keep up. And so, um, you know, fundraising is, is one option, but, you know, partnering with a company like Harness just seemed ideal because, you know, we had similar vision. Um, you know, Harness, you know, wants to, to be more involved in the open source community, wants to be a great steward for drone and, and, I think it was just a unique, it, it was kind of like right place, right time. Everything just kind of fit. And yeah, I mean, I think this will be great for the project. Yeah, I was, I mean, I was surprised when I looked at your original website back in, I think it's 2012, it had CI as a service. And obviously um, running marketing for Harness, when we came out of Stealth, our message was CD as a service. And so just by probably chance, or the, the, the stars are lining. Uh, yep. things seem to, to kind of to line up for us. Um, what are your key lessons learned? Like what advice would you give to those engineers out there that were maybe in a job and they're frustrated with a particular challenge in software delivery and they might be thinking like I can build that? Sure. Well, you know, yeah, if you're if you're an engineer and, and you know, there's an itch you want to scratch and you want to build something, um, you know, the first thing I would say is it takes a lot longer than you would anticipate. You know, if you had told me eight years ago or however long it was that that it would uh, it would take this long for for drone to get where it is today, I I wouldn't have believed you. I thought things would move much faster. Um, so you you know you have to be committed and in, in, in it for the long haul. And um, you know, open source is phenomenal, right? Uh, you have an incredible community. You get to collaborate with tons of people. Uh, you get way more feedback than you could ever imagine uh, on a product, but it's also a ton of work and can lead to burnout. And so, uh, you know, those are those are things that that you consider before you move forward. Uh, if there's one thing you could go back in time 
and change? Is there what would you do differently? You know, I, I think if there's yeah, if there's one thing I could change, we would have we would have continued, you know, we we would have focused on the enterprise. Uh, but we would have done SaaS differently. Uh, you know, I love the way Harness does SaaS, you know, today where you can actually run the workloads on on uh, on your own servers, right? So it keeps all the data, all the code, you know, everything running on your own servers. I think in, in retrospect, that that model that Harness uses is is pretty great. And I think, you know, I would love to bring that sort of offering to, or would have loved to bring that sort of offering to, to the community and the drone customers. Um, so that that's definitely one thing I would have changed. Great. So uh, thanks for sharing that story. Uh, when you actually shared it with me, I was laughing at parts of it because I couldn't believe some of them were true and just how amazed you, you've done it, how many hours you put in and just the commitment to, to never give up and just you, you've got a stamp of authority with some of the biggest companies in the world. Um, and you don't need these stories like like once in a decade maybe so thanks for sharing that and and really for for everyone on the on the the webinar what what questions do you have for brad um we'd love to kind of ask them and, and get your answers and and, and kind of get your feedback on on what you've been hearing so if you want to type in the, the chat the questions window um we'll see if we can get some of these questions answered for you so we got one question um what language should be considered in creating your own CI tool? So I think drones written in Go. Was there any kind of uh, any considerations you had back at the back in the day? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. So as you mentioned, drone is is written in Go. Um, this you know when I'll, I'll never forget when I first presented drone at a meetup. Uh, I had a slide, and it showed. You know, for all the pain that I had felt with, with Jenkins, one thing they really got right was the, the install process. You can actually install Jenkins in one command. And so at the time, I felt that it was incredibly important that you could install Drone in one command. Uh, you know, as a developer, I remember going through all these tutorials where you wanted to install software and it was 15 steps or 20 steps and it was gonna take two days. And so that was kind of a design constraint up front. I, it was that you can install Drone in one command. And so the great thing about Go is that it allowed us to distribute it in a single binary file with everything you needed included. It was low footprint. Um, you know, I think, you know, you can run drone maybe 10, 20 megabytes of, of RAM. So uh, pretty much pick the, the cheapest, uh, you know, digital ocean server uh, and, and you could run drone on it. And so Go was, was a big piece of that, um, just making it really easy to install and uh, a very small number of, of moving parts. Got it. Another question. Um, what kind of software have you considered for the web UI of the tool you, when you were building it? So we've, we've probably tried everything uh, and iterated on a bunch of different things. Um, that's probably also another lesson learned. Don't iterate so much. Uh, but, you know, we started out with, um, you know, something more traditional where we were doing server side rendering through Go templates. Uh, tried web components early on, but they, they weren't quite ready. That was a couple years ago. Uh, ultimately settled on Vue. Uh, so we do a single page application with Vue and it works great. Okay. Uh, another question. What was the tipping point or catalyst that spurred you to create your own company? Um, do you remember the moment and how did it make you feel? Yeah, I think it's, it's something I knew I wanted to do. So, you know, it wasn't kind of a spur of the moment decision. Um, it had been something I would thinking about for years, right? When you're, you know, when I was in the enterprise, I just saw so much room for, you know, so much need. I, I felt like there was, there was a ton of opportunity to build software that would benefit these large enterprises. And, and it just kind of felt like a lot of enterprise software was kind of big and clunky and it wasn't really built for the developers, right? Uh, uh, I think back to the mid 2000s and, you know, salespeople weren't even selling to developers. We had no buying power, right? They would come in and they would pitch to the CTO and they would sell it to them or the CIO. And, and then they, you know, we would be told what software to use. And so I just saw, you know, a ton of opportunity for improvement. And, 
it was actually, it, it sounds right. I, I got promoted and, and quit my job a week later, right? It sounds a little reckless, but it's something I actually saved up for and planned for, for, for a number of years. So it was really, um, you know, watching my bank account and, and saying, okay, now I can do this. No, it's, I mean, yeah, it takes, it takes a lot of courage to do that. Um, next question. Did you have someone to help you with the UI to design it? Um, or what did you do it yourself? Yes. So the, the, you know, this is a shout out to uh, pixel point. Um, they, they came in and um, designed our website and build out our, our web UI. Uh, the drones web user interface was, was in that sense, community contributed, right? They came in as volunteers and built this incredible user interface for us. We even got a question from a salesperson. Um, how can salespeople do a better job selling to developers? <laughs> Probably a question you weren't expecting, but might as well answer it. Oh, um, sure. That's a that's a great question. Uh, I think you know most developers they just want to install something and get started with it, right? And so this actually sort of conflicts with with sales and, and marketing organizations because they usually want to collect an email. And they want to have you sign up for something. Uh, so something that, that we do with drone is right. You can just download it. You don't have to talk to anyone uh, to get up and running. Uh, so I think that's incredibly important for adoption. And then I think you know, from a sales perspective, the selling really starts um, with the the com from from the community aspect, right? Those developers that are downloading it now, they they need help installing it. They're going to have questions. They're going to ask about best practices, and so you know your your support engineers that are manning those forms, they they effectively become uh, pre-sales. And so my advice to sales, you know, to selling to developers is really, um, you know, focus on on making it frictionless to get started, making sure you're you're helping them get started with the platform from a, a technical perspective, um, and, and making sure they're successful. And and I think at that point, you know the it makes the sales conversations a lot easier, uh, at least in my limited experience, um, you know, as a, as a developer, not a salesperson. Great. Thank you all for questions. If you've got any more, feel free to type them in. Um, as, as Brad mentioned, um, you can actually go to draw an IO, you can go to GitHub, um, you can download it. You can also take a free trial of Harness as well. Just go to our website and sign up. Um, and yeah, the, the frictionless process is is almost the proofs in the pudding. If if the download and the product works, and engineers feel like they can achieve something with it, um, they're already half sold. I guess is the, is probably the answer to that. Okay, um, a few more questions. What do you think the top three trends are for CI/CD in the future? Like, where do you see it going? Sure. Um... I mean, I think probably the biggest trend I see is trying to uh, extend, uh, you know, Kubernetes to support continuous integration uh, workflows, right? I mean, if you look at uh, Kubernetes, it, it wasn't originally designed for that use case. It was designed more for long running services, and then it's kind of expanded and, and you can um, use it for, for batch jobs. And I, I think there's a ton of teams um, yeah, and, and projects, myself included, uh, who want to, you know, natively use use Kubernetes for pipelines and just to plug drone, you know, we do have a Kubernetes runner where you can run Kubernetes native pipelines. Um, I think the other big trend uh, is, you know, CI is still, it's been around for a long time, but it's still in its its infancy uh, in a way, right? It, it just, you have a pipeline, it runs your tasks. So I, I think trends, in, the trend is really taking it to the next level. How do we make it more intelligent? Um, you know, how do we blend it with machine learning? You know, uh, we want to be respectful of developers time. We don't want you sitting there waiting 30 minutes uh, for a pipeline to complete. So, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we optimize it, make it smarter, uh, make it faster? Um, yeah, I, I think that's the next big trend. Cool. It's funny you mentioned that. One of the the reason I drank so much tea when I was a developer was because my build took 24 minutes and I did it like <laughs> three or four times a day. And I always used to go make the team tea during that time. So uh, thanks for all your questions. Thanks, Brad, for telling your story. And, and thank you all for, for, for joining us. And um, 
yeah, see you again sometime. There'll, there'll be a recording of this if you want to catch up as well. Okay. Excellent. 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 All right, guys. Um, yeah. Thank you for to everybody who did submit questions. We had some really great ones. I, I enjoyed listening to the, the conversation and the answers to the questions that came in. Um, do want to quickly remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, if you just want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Uh, following today's webinar, we are sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars and look in the on demand section. It should be right there waiting for you. And while you're there, please uh, check out some of the other webinars that we have both upcoming and on demand. Hopefully there'll be some there that pique your interest. All right, great. Um, before we close things out, I did mention at the top of the hour that we would be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get to that. Okay, our first winner today is Glenn E. Congratulations, Glenn. Next question, or next, next winner uh, is uh, Francis M. Congratulations, Francis. Third winner today is Tamara or Tamara C. Congratulations. And our final winner today is Alexandra M. Congratulations, Alexandra. And uh, congratulations to all four of you. Please check your inbox uh, for information on your $25 Amazon gift card. If you don't see anything in your inbox, please check your spam fol folder. Um, okay, Steve and Brad, thank you so much for, like I said, oh, what an interesting conversation that was. It's it's always fascinating to hear about the uh, the historical perspective and uh, how things came to be. So I wish you both the best of luck, uh, Brad, with Drone and uh, and Harness. And um, uh, I I'd love to have a conversation with you guys uh, maybe in about another year and uh, see how things are going for you guys. Right. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Great. Thanks. I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody, and have please stay safe. Thanks.